Welcome to Seven Skills for the Future podcast. I'm Emma Sue Prince and I'm joined by my producer, James. Hi, Emma Sue, and hello, everyone. So welcome to the show. This podcast is all about putting you in the driving seat of your own life. You're going to be so much happier, live a life of purpose and meaning just by using these seven skills. In the last series, we had a great lineup of interviews from luxury hotel manager Thomas Koch on the importance of excellence and adaptability to stand-up comedian Stuart Goldsmith talking about resilience and rejection. I also looked at rethinking how you're interacting with social media, how a great morning routine can literally save your life, and whether or not integrity means never telling a lie. Lots more in series two, so do catch up if you haven't had a chance to listen yet. So let's move on to the theme of today's episode. You've called this episode Working Smarter. So what does working smarter actually mean? Well, I think working smarter is really about becoming more productive and it's about actually putting all seven skills into action. Um, I think we're becoming a lot less productive with shorter attention spans and we have an overload of work and information coming at us all the time with lots of distractions. So I think it's a, the key difference is, is, is between working hard and working smart. So when we've got a big project on the go, the tendency is to just work harder. You know, we just keep working and working and it feels really good and we wear that badge of busyness and long hours with great pride but it's actually not really effective and especially when you combine that with the urge to work on several things at once and have email open and you don't chunk your time properly so a major culprit on our productivity and ability to work well is distraction so what is the impact of all this distraction distraction happens in two ways i think it's quite important to understand the two basic main ways it happens one is internal so that happens through mind wandering or being a bit anxious about something or thinking about past events or future events and actually the main strategy for handling this is practicing mindfulness because it keeps us nicely in the present so we have internal distraction that comes from inside ourselves and then we have external distraction and that's basically noise and noise Noise is anything from what's around us, so anything like notifications, pings of emails, messages, but also things like interruptions from other people. And the amount of noise that's around us is increasing all the time, all the time. A few impacts of it, of distraction, First of all, we're less efficient. So we know that it takes about 20 minutes to get back on task after a distraction. So that's going to impact the quality of what we're doing. Uh, we're less effective because we are usually not fully listening and we're not fully present when things are happening. So for at a meeting, for example, it, it becomes very easy to switch off very quickly. A third impact is that we could be missing out. So if we're distracted, we might miss out on an opportunity. We, we might miss out on a really important conversation or a relationship. And, you know, these are all vital and they're important things for our life, for our work, but also for our well-being. And I think the, the, the fourth major impact is that we're just less calm. Um, we're not as good at, at making decisions because we're just very reactive because we're kind of just reacting to all that distraction around us. What are some practical ways to handle distraction? I mean, what are the things that actually really work in your view? Well, I think there are three things that anyone can start doing probably immediately and experience a change. OK, so the first one is to time yourself. So although people talk about managing time, actually very few people will assign a time limit to a task. Um, so to-do lists will, will help and, and grouping tasks helps as well. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get them done to completion in the time frame that you allotted. Thinking about time and timing a project and actually working out how long will this element take me if it's something that needs to be broken down? Well, how long will this take me in total? And the more that you time yourself and get more awareness of how long a particular type of task takes you, the more you'll be able to actually allocate 
the, the proper amount of time into your schedule. So I think timing yourself is, is quite a good thing to start doing. The second is to theme your time. So if you can theme your time, it kind of frees your mind to focus on the tasks that are critical to making progress. And it kind of avoids this decision fatigue that we can be prone to. So theming your days uh, or even your months gives you less to think about when you're trying to decide what to do. But it's also great for helping to ensure work-life balance. So an example of time theming is, is for me is I've started making Fridays. It doesn't happen every Friday, but I've started making Friday a yoga and mindfulness morning and an admin day. And that's my theme for the day. And it comes at the end of the week. So big projects would have been front loaded to the beginning of the week and always the first couple of hours of my day. And the third thing that I think will have an immediate impact is to have some kind of email strategy. So most people do not have one at all. They just don't have one. And I think email is one of the biggest productivity killers that I could possibly think of because you are multitasking and you don't actually realize it. Most people have their emails open when they're working on something. So every time a new email comes in, they'll click on it and stop what they're doing and read the email. And then you've got to decide whether you're going to respond to the email, whether you're going to check on it later, or, you know, eventually you're going to have to go back to your original task and try and remember where you left off. And you're always going to be less efficient when you do that. And this is something I've experienced myself over and over again. When I have email open, I just start to check it when something comes in. The problem with this kind of behavior is that you can feel like you're working hard and you can feel like you're constantly busy, but actually all you're doing is you're shifting tasks and you're you're shifting your focus. So, you know, really good thing is to have a specific time in the day for checking email, have proper filters on your email so you know who's writing to you, you know, just have some kind of strategy and then, you know, have a way of getting rid of emails, you know, uh, just deleting them, you know, filing them if you have to, but get, get rid of them. My big goal is to never have any emails in my inbox. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I've, uh, I've actually reached that goal, but that's what, uh, one of my big goals. But let me ask you a question, James. Um, yes. When you're under pressure and you've got a deadline and it's a big project, what's your usual strategy in that situation? It's funny you ask me because I'm I am kind of in that at the moment. Well, I, you know, we've done a few of these podcasts now, Emma Sue, so I have taken some of your advice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and what I try to do mainly is to make sure that I can focus, right? So I, mm. I this distraction is exactly the thing that I think I think about most when it comes to this. So I try to make sure that when I need to work on this project, that that I'm not distracted i put my phone away from me for a while uh, mm-hmm. just just even if i just turn it upside down just so i can't see it, uh, any notifications i'll put my computer into do not disturb mode for a bit just so i can get some of that work done and then i'll dip out check what's going on in the outside world and then i'll <laughs> go back in back in again so that's that's uh, that's my main approach at the moment yeah, yeah, it's really good. That's a really, really good approach. Oh, good. I've I've learned something. That's good. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good because what you're doing is you're you're kind of chunking your time and you're um, allowing yourself to focus. So that's really, really good. Actually, when I talk to people who are really busy and working on sort of several projects, what they'll tell me is that they will just keep working till it's done. So they'll work really long hours. They'll even work late into the night because they have a deadline. But actually, the problem with that is that our brain's energy just gets used up a lot faster this way you know so we have a kind of diminished result at the end of it so I think once we kind of realize that it can be very motivating to try and work in a different way because you actually get get more done and I think people can also have certain times of the day when they're more productive so speaking for myself as an example mornings are are a great time for me so I'm, I'm, I'm generally quite creative and focused and speeding ahead in the mornings and then afternoon late afternoon I can start feeling a bit more sluggish and I think Mm. that's simply my brain's sort of running out of working capacity this is about pacing pacing oneself and understanding better how the brain works 
So for me, especially, if I spend the first part of my day checking emails or, or doing something which is more admin related or not actually linked to my core work, it actually it's actually using up my energy. Once I kind of realized that, I, I thought, gosh, yeah, I need to preserve that energy. So if it's something that doesn't require a lot of my brain, I'll just shift that to later in the day. And I'm completely useless at working in the evenings. I know, I know for some people that could be a really creative time, but I'm just... I just cannot work in the evenings. Um, So I think it's it's understanding for yourself, you know, when is your best time to to work and understanding a bit more about about how our brains work. I think for a lot of people, you know, you can feel that checking email or or doing that particular activity is a worthwhile use of time. It's important. But, you know, I do love the strategy of basically not doing any of that until you've done at least two hours of work. I do love that idea. You know, (laughs) I think it's it's an effective one. But, you know, also things like there's a, a method of working 90 minutes at a time. So 90 minutes and then a five minute rest and then change focus. And that can be very effective if you've got if you've got several things that are on the go and you break it down into 90 minute chunks. For some reason, 90 minutes works. It's called the Pomodoro effect. You just get more done. So when I think about my own projects that I'm doing at the moment, I find of, as well that I have very different types of work that I need to do. So Mm -hmm. one of them at the moment involves a lot of writing and it's very creative. And I find that I can't do it for hours and hours at a time because I really have to try and figure out the way to make this work. So it's quite heavy and uh, demanding on me. So I I have to really um, do that work for a while and then step away from Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But something like podcasting, for example, when I'm editing a podcast, it uses a completely different Mm -hmm. set of skills. And I I find that I I can do that uh, at any time of day. So do you think that uh, that's another factor we have to take into account? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think there are some tasks that just require more of our brain's energy, especially when it comes to knowledge tasks. So anything like cre- being creative, putting together a project, writing writing a, a report or, or anything that requires a lot of brain power as opposed to a skill. So the podcast editing is like a skill that you could probably do at any time of the day. But the brain heavy things are where you need to tap into that super productivity so I do I I think it does yeah I think it definitely makes makes a difference I also think that you know they say that um, beauticians and hairdressers are are some of the happiest workers on the planet because when they finish their shift that's it there's nothing they have to do after that you know whereas for knowledge workers and people who are freelance the day kind of never stops you know it just goes on and on and on and I think we have to learn to put those boundaries in place that we can be more productive So I'd like to tell you a story about two people. We've got Rachel and Roger, and they're like little mini case studies. And I want to tell you about them. And then you can tell me, or you can have to think about who you think is more productive. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so so Rachel. So Rachel works for 10 hours in a given day. She works 10 hours pretty much without stopping. She's at her desk, head down most of the day. When she's not running to and from meetings, so she's generally at her desk, she eats lunch at her desk, she begins work at about 80% of her capacity. So she's instinctively pacing herself. She knows she's got a long day ahead. By lunchtime, she's dropped to 60% of her capacity and is feeling fatigued. After 4 p.m., she's averaging about 40% capacity. So as a result of this, her thinking is uncreative. She makes errors. She has to go over her work again to correct the errors. And her enjoyment of the work is low. By the end of the day, she feels exhausted and has little energy to think about doing things outside of work in her leisure time. And as a result, she may well come home from that day, eat a ready meal and slump in front of the TV on the sofa. That's Rachel. Okay. Now we're going to meet Roger. So Roger works entirely differently. So he works the same amount of time. He works intensely for around an hour to 90 minutes. And then he takes a 15 minute break before working again. At lunchtime, he goes out either for a walk to the gym or to have lunch with friends. Around 3 p.m., he closes his eyes at his desk and takes a rest. Sometimes he just lets his mind wander, and sometimes he has a 15 to 20-minute nap. 
Finally, between 4.30 and 5, he takes a 15-minute walk outside. At the end of the day, he sits back for 15 minutes and reflects on his day, makes a list of what he's learned and what he will do tomorrow. He knows from research that people who do this increase productivity by as much as 23%. In the evening, Roger spends time on his own interests or seeing friends. So, Rachel and Roger, easy to to see here who's more productive, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So... And I'm not saying that we can all schedule our days like uh, like like Roger. These are obviously deliberate case studies that are kind of extreme examples. But I think we can all identify a little bit with Rachel sometimes and a little bit with Roger sometimes. It's about getting that balance and thinking about, you know, chunking some time and thinking about whether you're taking regular breaks or not. And, and I, I honestly think a lot of people just don't do that. So as usual, some great advice there, Emma Sue. I'm sure people who've been listening to this podcast for a while now, hopefully will start to be uh, a bit more like Roger than Rachel. That's the plan, right? Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, Okay. I think that brings us to the end of this episode. Yes, it does. Uh, Thank you so much for listening and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for listening to the seven skills for the future podcast there are all sorts of things you can do to boost each of the seven skills if you want more ideas you can buy the book seven skills for the future you can also go online to our website unimenta and join as a member and you'll be able to access more resources ideas and free downloads if you have a question you want to ask on these podcasts get in touch through instagram at seven skills for the future or on Twitter and Facebook at Unimenta. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your podcast player of choice.